Good evening. Good evening. It is the last of 30 talks. And it's good that we're ending <clears throat> with the pseudo Dionysius's great work, The Theologia Mystica. It is something I enjoy very much. It's a very short work. I've made copies of two translations for you. And what we're going to do is open it up, take a look at it, and see how it's built. Because we're going to go someplace with it. But first, why is there a problem? Why is there a theology of mysticism? Why is it theological, mystical treatise? We could ask it in another way. This should be a theology at all. Just mystical? Just mystical? Yeah. No, no, no. The reason you need a theologia is to have a mysticism. That's where we're going to have to... Good. Let's make it even clearer. All right. This is really the need for theology in order to have a mysticism. Not any theology, but a Platonic theology. Because there is an underlining problem that makes theology necessary. Not to anyone, but people are going to play this game. Here's the problem. Here is the central problem. And I think this is the only problem there is. Okay. What I want to show here is that there is no way you cannot experience. You're always experiencing. What's the problem? And that is what we believe we can do is to function with that experience in such a way that we can preserve the experience itself. We think we can function with it because we think we have grasped the nature of the experience and so we can function with it without impediment and difficulty. That's not the case. All right, here's the basic theory right here, see? The reality is that we have a filter and this filter is highly interpretive and therefore we don't really experience things directly. We experience it through that filter. And the great problem is that what ideally what we would like to do is to be able to understand the experience in itself. Have it, preserve it, and to do that, to be able to do that, really means that that filter is not there, the screen is not there that we've been able to eliminate it. Now, if you understand the experience, that means you have a set of things that you understand here. All right. You have the experience, whatever it is, the everyday world, and there should be a way to match the experience you're having with the categories, the ideas, and the thoughts, the images that you have. To the degree that there's a difference between the two, to that degree there's a distortion. To the degree that there's a distortion, to that degree you are not really able to experience the nature of your reality, nor can you understand it. So our great dream is we want to match the experience as purely as we can with our understanding. But our personal history, our culture, our religious beliefs, our own personal backgrounds, create this map, create this screen, create this filter. Now look here, here's the basic theory. As one understands, so one acts. You don't possess the experience, you possess, you possess your understanding of it. Because after the experience, Whatever it is you understand, 
whatever you understand, is through that filter. This filter provides the grounds for the experience. It also provides your re recollection of it. It's the filter creates what you think you experienced. The filter creates what you think you experienced. That's the problem. So you don't possess the experience, you possess your understanding of it. Therefore, it's only natural if this is the case, that you have to control and discipline the mind in order to minimize that influence. Because if you could experience truly, then you would see things just the way they are. Now, here we go into this curious work. How do you control and discipline the mind? There are two ways, two traditions. One is the Greek, the Hellenistic, or the Hellenic tradition. It's called emptying the mind. Essentially, it's detaching consciousness from its object. How do you do that? Here. By the proper, the proper naming of things frees the mind and naturally draws it to its proper objects. If you have misnamed something, then you're calling something something else and you're reacting to it as if it were the something else. By proper naming, you free the mind from that distorting device and as a consequence, the, the mind is naturally drawn to its proper objects, reflects it, and you can reflect upon it. Against this view is another one, where you focus the mind on an object. This is a restraint, restraining the mind, keeping it there on one object. And typically, we can therefore look at it in terms of any kind of yoga, that's the restraining device. Or you can take it in terms of uh, the pranayama, the most basic meditation technique, which is you focus on your breathing. Focus on the breath. If you focus on the breathing, you're trying to restrict your mind in such a way that the mind will follow the breath. And if it follows the breath, you know what it does? It pulls away from identifying with ideas and images and thought processes. That's the goal. Pull it away from here. Focus it here. Put your mind in the belly. Breathe nothing other than move. Focus on the breath. That's restraint. This other thing is rather curious because this is the Hellenic way. Let's take a look at it, because this is what the Theologica Mystica is doing. Now, you can just go through with me with the text you have in front of you. I'm using primarily the Alan Watts translation. I'm going to make a couple of changes as we go through it. But essentially, this is the way he's going to start. What's his goal? How to control the mind and discipline the mind by dealing with the mind itself, not by focusing on an object, that's restraint. So he starts out by setting out the goal. The goal is he talks about that trinity beyond being, it's the Godhead, it's the guardian of divine wisdom. Therefore, in the first paragraph there, you can see that there's a plea. This is a devotional, this is a devotional intellectual yoga. This is a devotional intellectual yoga. It's with the mind. The mind is, the, is now involved in this very image because look what it's saying. It's saying that this trinity, this triune state beyond being is the Godhead. It's the guardian of divine wisdom. And Pseudo Dionysius therefore asks as a prayer, direct us right, to, to that mystical revelation beyond thought, beyond light, to divine truth. But that divine truth, this divine truth is hidden in a darkness, a very profound darkness. And that's what we have to talk about. What does that mean to say that divine truth is hidden by divine darkness? Because it's radiantly clear. And as a matter of fact, 
if allowed to be seen for what it is, it overflows our mind with splendor and beauty. So that's it, right? It's an appeal to the nature of ultimate reality to direct us towards a mystic revelation that goes beyond thought and light to reach the divine truth. And that's the way of getting behind this great darkness. He has a se separate steps. He says, look here, if you want to do this, the thing to do is quit the senses, quit the intellect, quit all that's known and sensed. Actually, it's all sensed and known. Quit what is and what is not, because in that way you can attain oneness. And that's beyond all being and knowledge. Now, why is this called, if you were to do it, the darkness? The dark night of the soul, the darkness. Right. Now, you can do it in a few moments. You can do it right now, and you can see what it's like. Right. Consider, if you have a, a moment to reflect, you will now want to pursue a vision of ultimate reality. There you are. You decide no longer to do this, right? Rather than that, we'll see whether we can put a Greek in here for a moment. And he wants to gain that ultimate vision. A uh, vision of what? Of the nature of what is. All right. You have to get a vision of the nature of what is, truly. All right. The nature of what is. Uh, by the way, because you want to reach the reality, the ultimate reality. Well, no, 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 no. Have to give that up. You see, you can't deal with what is. That's out. Okay, you're still after your quest, aren't you? Okay, don't go the other way either. Don't think about that it's not. So don't think of either, uh, if you want, as a theology, don't think of either God as being or as being or not being. All right. Now, still, you still are going to pursue this, are you not? You're going to pursue this. Good, good, good. You're going to gain some knowledge? You hopefully? No, no, no. No, you have to quit all knowledge. Oh, quit. Oh, yeah. yeah, you have to quit all knowing. <laughs> right? Okay. You still are going to try something, though, aren't you? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Right? You still have the devotional urge, do you not? Yes. Good. Now, would you uh, restate what it is we're going to do now? And let's see whether you can obey these four points. Okay, here you are in this beautiful picture. All right, what's it do? Uh, miss, do it. You have to quit everything. How can you quit the senses? You guys aren't being fair. Look, just do it. Just do it and let's stop this rebellion. You are not going to in any way concern yourself with the senses, are you? Good, good, good. You're going to forget about using the intellect, aren't you? Good, good. And you're not going to deal with anything sensed. You're not going to deal with any kind of knowing, are you? No knowledge. Good, good, good. And you're not going to deal with what either is or is not. That wasn't, I didn't hear you. So. Oh, what do you do? You don't now look here. You don't think are you or are you not involved in this quest? Oh, yes. I Thank you. Now do something. What kind of directions are those? Those are four directions. I label what them one, two, three, four. This what kind are they? Clean, very cleanly stated. I've enjoyed the handwriting. That's, that's real good, too. It doesn't tell you how to quit. Uh, there's no way. There's no method. You just do it. Now, are you now in a devotional mood? Say yes, please. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you're now, you're after the one, are you not? Yes. Good. How are you going to do it? Quit. What? Since just quit. Just quit. Pardon me, that's not. Quit. I can't even quit. Oh, you can't, can't even quit. quit. Can't yeah. Even. <laughs> now, are you going to do this or not? Don't tell me the difficulty you're having. Just tell me what kind of state of mind it puts you. No, what point of view is just a surrender? Look here. Then you're doing, 
But you're doing what something. you're not supposed to do. You watch the surrender business. It can't be is not. Either. It neither is nor is not. If you're going to attain, <laughs> well, okay, how, all right. Can you do it? Sure. Wait a minute. If you do it, there must be some way to do it. Yeah, Are you going doing it because you want to get some knowledge? Uh uh No knowledge beyond knowledge. Yeah. Right. What does this do? What does this little exercise do? Irritate you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> More. What does it do? <laughs> I don't know, you can't even talk about what it does. So, I mean, it puts you in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Now stay there. Okay. Now you've been introduced to Pseudo Dionysius. Because that's the way to attain oneness. It is beyond being and all knowledge. So, if you in any way if in any way there's any sense in you. Now here's the problem, you see, let's put it in here. You can't cheat on the mind. If there's a little, a little subtle idea in here, in your mind, that you're, you know that there really is something you want, but you're not supposed to say that you want it, and therefore, you know, you just do it, and that's the game. Uh-uh, no way, illegitimate. So not the slightest, not the slightest tendency, not the slightest, subtlest belief must operate in this game. So it's, it, yeah, it'll, it'll irritate you. Good. Where, where are you going to get into? The dark night of the soul. Good. Good. That's the way. Ah, good. Now. Now that we have that goal clear in mind, we can talk about the cause of all things. All right, let's see whether we can follow it because we're pushing the same idea. The cause of all things, the one. Now, look here, it's totally unknowable. You know that already, don't you? And therefore, it's uh, unutterable. As it was just said, you can't utter anything about it. It's beyond being and it's above all nature, since it's the cause of all things. Can't be in nature. Right? Now look here. This is only revealed to those, right, can only be revealed to those a special group of people. Those people who then can consider that all things are impure and pure and they're going to drop both. You're going to go beyond the sacred. You're going to give up uh, the spiritual heights. You're going to give up all heavenly lights, all heavenly sounds. Give up ecstasy too. Yes, yes. <laughs> You're going to be taken up into this darkness of the soul. All right, look here. Try it again. We're going to stay here. All right, what do you want? You want to in some way, how you can describe it now. You'd like to know the cause of all things, but to know means knowledge, so you can't say that. All right, all right. All right. You know what's unutterable, but you're still going to continue. It's unknowable, it's beyond being above nature. All right, now let's take a look. We're at one three. Do you see now we can follow everything we're doing tonight because you have the text in front of you? All right. Oh, you don't? Well, yes, you do. You'll get it quick. Now this is an extremely interesting section. And here you are, sir, with your copy. Again, this is an Alan Watts translation. The excellent cause of all things may be revealed with many words, with few words, or with even no words, inasmuch he is both unalterable, unutterable, and unknowable. Because beyond being, he stands above all nature. He is truly revealed without covering only to those who pass above, you have to pass above, above all things that are pure, all things that are impure, above. You have to pass above them and beyond them. 
Would you agree we're on page 27? Notice the language, all right? You have to go beyond all climbing of sacred heights. You have to leave, leave behind all heavenly lights and sounds, supernal discourses. And watch and are taken up into that darkness where he truly is who is beyond all things. This will get you here. Look here. If you do that, this is what it's promising. If you're able to do that, this will by itself take you up into that darkness to him who is beyond all. This is the method. But you can't indulge in any of these, can you? The implications of these. Now, Pseudo Dionysius is very, very important figure. Probably the most important thinker there is in the whole Western European tradition. He framed theology for Christianity. He framed it all for St. Thomas Aquinas. He framed it all for the great thinkers. And he's been repudiated because they discovered it was a forgery. But the works are astonishingly profound. Watch what he does now. We're now going to see how clever this man is. He now talks about Moses. All right, now he has to talk about religious figures because his goal is to try to represent himself in the tradition of Christianity while at the same time infusing into it the highest insights of Platonic, Neoplatonic thought. That's his goal. Under the cover, under the cover, it's really a cover, it's a disguise. He's going to write in such a way that he's going to appear to many to be a Christian. He's going to use that, that cover to introduce and perpetuate Greek learning, which at this point was being eclipsed by the rise of Christianity and the closing of the pagan schools of philosophy, which of course are Plato's schools, Platonic schools. So let's look at the way he talks about Moses. Clever enough, he says what Moses had was really a vision. This is my language, but it's really a secondary vision wasn't really profound enough. Let's see how he does it, he says. He says, first, Moses was purified. And once he was purified, he was set aside from those who weren't purified. He had heard many trumpets, sounds, multitude of lights, and shining beams of light in a variety of ways. Isn't this what we just found out that you should ignore? Yeah, is that where he is? Yes. Then, after this, after this, he set aside, he went before the priest to the uttermost peaks of sacred heights. Wait a minute, didn't we just say that you should avoid such things? Now he reflects back on it, and he makes this wonderful statement about Moses. He saw only the place where he, capital H, he, God, dwells. He never went any further. That's the limit of his vision. He saw only the place where he dwells, going this way. And then he has another great line. Well, all of this, all of these spiritual experiences are nearly, are merely images of things subordinate to him because he transcends them all. Now, all of this, however, may be known of the mind. This, all this can be known. This can be known. This can be known. This all can be known. But what, what was known is only the place where he dwells. Not where he is. That's where, in other words, you found the bed body's gone. <laughs> gone, right? <laughs> Open the coffin, nothing there. Those are all images of things. That's right. To him. Only, yeah. what? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Image, those what? are all images that, yeah. of things subordinate to the he, okay. to the one. Or, all right. I just wanted to make sure. Now, notice what he's doing. He is structuring in such a way that what he is going to say is going to have a higher status than Moses. He's placing himself on top of 
and beyond Moses. Is that great? All right, here it is. So therefore, he has to say then, all right, if that way fails, then what is the manner to be united with God? And that's the method, a very interesting method. Right. Take away all things from him. Now, you know what that means? Whether you like it or not, everybody, especially you, have, everyone has, an idea of God. And that's why they're ignorant. And that's why they're ignorant. Everyone has an idea of God. Now that idea of God or ultimate reality is nothing other than the screening device. That's the problem. So look here. Then what if that's the case, then what is the matter to be united with God. That's, that's easy, that's easy. That image, whatever image you have, take away from him everything. Whatever image you have of God, it's wrong. Now that means you have to discover it, it means you have to admit to yourself that you have it, it means you have to admit in one way or the other that there is such an image in your mind and everyone has one. And the people who have the most, you know, some of the most interesting images are atheists. They call themselves right. Yeah, one of the most interesting <laughs> ones, right? Because they think he doesn't exist. Yeah. And they're right. But that's an idea. Yeah, but that's, he doesn't exist the way they think of him as existing. He, they're, they're quite right. But they don't know they're quite right. Yeah. The right opinion yeah. The idea that they have of him, they're quite, they're, it's quite right. It does not exist. Right. Yeah, quite true. But we have to get it out, have to discover it. So you know, how do you discover it? He says, look here. You have to look at it in particular. You have to look at this image. And you have to go from particulars to universals. <clears throat> That's the way you're going to proceed, right? From particulars to universals. Like, if we could gather one. Um, when I, watch, let's see if we can do it this way. When you think about God, which one of these comes natural? Got to strip that away. All three. So whatever image you have, you see, will have a particular boundary. And everyone's is likely to be different if they're in mixed different traditions. Sometimes traditionally you can have just one idea, but many variations of that one idea. Now, if you can do that, then we may know openly what is, in fact, the unknowable. First time he uses this language. And what will you then discover? That the darkness beyond being conceals the truth. Because that image, that filtering device, is nothing other than the screen. And when we think of dropping that screen, we panic. And our panic is nothing other than what we're clinging to, and that's our own darkness. So, this is a particular interesting way of going, and we can talk about it later. This is also the form of a dialectic. Now, then, what may be affirmed? What can be affirmed? Can anything be affirmed of that? No. What's interesting, what he does, is he goes through a review of three of his works, the theological outlines, divine names, symbolic theology. Why? This is so clever. The guy is so interesting. Because by making you go through this, you'll see then that you may, in fact, recognize there may be some of those images attached to your idea of God. And then what do you have to do? You have to see in what way you can say you can affirm them. So now we have a different shift, a different shift entirely. You see, 
there is a way of affirming what may be affirmed of God. Now, if you want to speak and you want to explain the nature of God, then here's your task. Here's your task. And this is the work called Theological Outlines. He said, what you should be able to do is learn how to talk about God as one, as three, as a fatherhood, as sonship, as spirit. That means there is a vocabulary. There is a vocabulary appropriate for each. There's a way of talking about each that's distinctive. There's a way in which this is hierarchically arranged. So therefore, notice the way he now says, which is interesting. You see, you have to see how he is in himself. You want to see how these relate in themselves, by himself, in himself. Right? Then you want to see how these are mutual terms. You want to see how there is a co-eternal aspect to each of them. That means co-eternal, that they exist together in various ways. Right. And you want to see then that each, most importantly, how there's a propagation from each of these. Propagation, how from each one of these there's something that follows that is propagated, propagated, generated. Right. And then finally you have to see how Jesus is the substance of the human nature, of human nature. You see, what does that mean? That means we're taking a course in language. We're learning how to make distinctions. When you're talking about how to affirm what kind of affirmations you can make about God, you know what that will do? I will say, okay, if you want to say certain things about God, then this is what you can do. You have to decide whether he's one. You have to know the vocabulary of it. How he's three or a trinity. You have to be able to talk about them. You have to know how each of the parts relate because there's a mutuality between them. You have to talk about each part of the Trinity. You have to know that there's a certain vocabulary in a certain way that's appropriate to each. You're disciplining your mind. You're disciplining your thinking. Right, so therefore that if you do have an image of God in your mind, now at least it's consistent. You know what you're doing. It's not unconscious. Because this is the God about which you can affirm something. That is, God that is. So you get an education in theology. Okay, now what is the proper way to talk about all of these? You should know what you're talking about in a theology that affirms things about the nature of God and the whole theology. All right, so what, what else do you need? He's got another work called the Divine Names. Now, notice, same structure, how he may be called good, being, life, wisdom, and power. Um, those, those names that you have up there are different, or those terms you have up there are different than the ones you just had. Because the other ones are theological terms. They're These are philosophical. Those, those terms you had were, are, in my understanding, related to Christianity. Yes. So he's yes. focusing within Christianity on terms that yes. they would know. But he's going to use terms that are philosophical when he defines them theologically. He's going to give you a philosophical vocabulary to talk about each one of those. Okay. Thank you. That's clever. All right, look. The next work he has, which he's quoting, he's giving a description of this in the work, his symbolic theology. Now do you know what you have to do? You now have to see, you have to take a course in symbolic theology. You have to know <clears throat> how divine names can be taken from sense experience, how they can be taken from divine forms, from figures, from members of the body as it were, from places, from certain realms because this allows you to talk about God as an image. The proper way to talk about God is an image. Ah, what does that do? That means systematically any idea you have as you go through this, if he has a whole catalog of ideas that can be called and identified as being images of God, you may discover some of your own. 
and now you know that they belong in this theology. What is that doing? It's identifying them and positioning them and showing how they should be used. But none of these, but none of these deal with the mystical theology. Now, if all of these terms, if all of the possible terms in these three categories can then be ordered in such a way that we know their proper use, then you're not going to apply them That's right, to the highest term. He. That's right, that's, that's where they got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's where they got it. Bayes said, that's where he got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, now, these, as you know, are the key Platonic terms. The good, being, life, wisdom, power. All right, these are the proper names. These are called the divine names. And by the way, the last set of names he uses in this work come right out of Plato's Parmenides. So, now, what, with all of this, what can you say about the maker? Now, this is real curious writing. And I'd like to have a little fun with you and we can read it together because it's so clever the way he is writing this. Of course, everything I'm saying comes out of the text. All right. Let me first ask you a question that's important to me. If you neither lack money nor a car nor humor, what have you? Thank you. Say it louder. Very good. What a good class. Now watch the language. Now, now he's going to talk about God the maker. And notice the language. I'm on page 31, section 4. We say, therefore, that the transcendent maker of all things lacks neither being, nor life, nor reason, nor mind. Therefore, what does he have? That's right. These are three trinities. These are three, right? Each one fits together, right? Each one fits together. Right? You put being, mind, life, reason, mind, power, light, right? In any case, that's the way they're related. But anyhow, these are the kinds of things you can attribute to the transcendent maker. Now, it's a transcendent maker, it presupposes that the transcendent maker must be making something. It wouldn't be called a maker. So he has to have some kind of existence, has to have some kind of life, has to be able to make, you have to have some kind of reason if you're going to make whatever it is you're going to make. Right? Presupposes a mind, does it not? And some power to do what you're doing and must be in some way involved in sufficient light to know what you're doing. Agree? That's the same idea as omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, and yeah. omnipresent. That's where we're going. All right. So therefore, this is what you can say about a God that is a transcendent maker. Ah! Transcendent. Ah! D-E-N-T. -E right. All right. In the rush of... Now, look here. It's only now that he returns to the subject, the last section... He partakes not of the intelligible things who is preeminently their maker. These are all, these are all intelligible things. These are all intelligible things. These are all intelligible things. He partakes not of these things who is preeminently their maker. But he doesn't partake. He partakes not of these. Therefore, would you not agree? If he doesn't partake in them, these will be denied. Would you agree? Would you agree? Well, then we should be able to find it very easy to read, should we not? Yes, would we not? 
You don't have to. Why don't you read and tell us? <laughs> Section 5, page 32. Read it out loud. Yes. 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 These are the things you can say about the transcendent maker. But then you're saying that he doesn't partake of those things. So but if he doesn't partake of these intelligible things, then I cross them out. Right. Then you can't say that of the maker then. Pardon me? Then you can't say that of the transcendent maker then. Well, if there is a transcendent maker, he stands apart from the things that he's making. Right. Would you agree? He neither lacks this, 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 or this. Yeah. Thank you, that's what he says. Now, if we want to say that the, now we're talking about him in the highest sense, and now we're saying he partakes not of these things. He has them, right? In other words, it's like an artist. He paints a picture. He's beyond. The picture is, he's beyond the picture, but the picture is, Embodies everything from. Oh, I thought those are things that he has in order to paint the picture. He's not being like freedom. Pardon? Do it again? I thought those are things that he possesses in order for him to paint the picture. These are the things he must have to be a transcendent maker. Right. Then why is it then that you didn't say that he partakes not of those things? Because now we're talking about a higher aspect of God than as a transcendent maker. The painter is not the canvas. Even though the painter painted the canvas. But this isn't the canvas. Those are the things that he, he can't paint unless he has being, life, reason, mind, power, and light. Yes. By the way, do you think there might be something higher than a transcendent maker? Transcendent? Big transcend is transcendent maker? Yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. assume, there, assume for the moment there is. Okay. <laughs> All right? Okay. Good. Then you wouldn't use those terms to describe them, would you? I didn't hear you. <laughs> well, I don't, what would he be doing if he's trying to send a transcendent maker? Pardon me. <laughs> Will you assume for the moment that there's something higher than a transcendent maker? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. If there is something that's higher than a transcendent maker, then he can't be participating in those things that he transcends. Okay. All right. okay. If that's the case, and if that's what he's saying, we should see that each of these are being denied okay. when you're talking about something that is preeminently beyond it. Try reading first. Okay, number five. That he partakes not of intelligible things who is preeminently their maker. Going yet higher, we say that he is neither a soul nor a mind. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait. Not a mind? No. Nope. Go ahead. Nor an object of knowledge. No, well, not an object of knowledge. Go neither ahead. has he opinion nor reason. No, no reason. Nor intellect. All right. All right. Neither is he reason. Huh? nor thought, nor is he utterable, or knowledge. Mm -hmm. Neither is he number, order, greatness, littleness, equality, inequality, likeness, nor unlikeness. Neither does he stand, nor move, nor is he quiescent. Neither has he power, nor There is goes power, power, there goes light. Nor light, neither does he mm -hmm. live, nor is life. Neither is he being, nor eternity, nor time. Nor is he, nor is his touch knowable. Neither is he no knowledge, nor truth, nor kinship, kingship, nor wisdom, nor one, nor oneness, nor divinity, nor goodness. Neither is he spirit, as we can understand it, nor sonship, nor fatherhood, nor any other thing known to us or to any other creature. Neither is he of things which are not, nor of things which are. Neither do the things which are understand him, as he is in himself, nor does he himself understand them, as existing in themselves. Hmm. Neither is there utterance of him, nor name, nor knowledge, neither is he darkness, nor light, nor falsehood, nor truth. Neither is there any entire affirmation or negation that may be made concerning him. But on the other hand, we make affirmations and denials of those things which are less than him and follow from him. But of him himself, we neither affirm nor deny anything since. He who is beyond all attributes is perfect and alone, the cause of all, 
beyond all negation, the height of that which is entirely is free from all and beyond all. Mm. What does that do? What does that do? If you're still involved in this quest, what does that do? What does that Mute do? You. you don't have anything to say. Right. Stay there. Yeah, nothing to cling to. <laughs> right, that's right. You ain't got nothing to cling to. That was even too much. <laughs> that's right. Ah, right. There may not even be a you that's clinging. Right, good. Now look here. Right. <laughs> now, if you wanted to explore any one of these terms to see what he means by them, in order to see the context in which they occur in the system, then you'd go into a work called the Divine Names. Then he would then have a discussion on, the, on, say, life, being, reason, any one of these, and then you could see how that idea, life, how necessarily it is included with other major ideas, and each of these are linked in others, so that you have a whole system of interrelated ideas that can represent by one term you'll see how all of these terms necessarily belong to this and equally with all the other terms so you can see that there's a meaningful way in which they can be arranged and related. Hey, therefore, the, the, all of these ideas which remained pre pre previously, or pardon me, that were previously scattered and unordered now fit into a structure. And now you know when to use them, you know when not to use them. You know why you should use them, and you know what purpose they're going to use, and you know what system you're in of the three systems he has. Wait a minute, suppose they're all the terms that, that you'd, whether you like it or not, you have for your idea of God. And now you're going for something beyond all of those names. You have to drop them. So the more you become familiar with the system, the easier it is to drop them. Or you will know where you should apply them appropriately, but not for this highest purpose. So therefore he has a whole set of terms he's drawn from the Bible, symbolic terms of what to call God. Then he has divine names, like in this case, talk about them. Right. Now, you also have the theological terms, the, what we call the theological terms, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the Trinity, the Three, One. So he has different terms which you can then pull out, take a look at, and talk about meaningful within each of their particular contexts. Now, I have here the Divine Names, a very beautiful book. This is a, a, a very fine translation, by the way, of the uh, Shrine. Uh, translation, the Shrine of Wisdom from England. So here I'm just pulling one idea concerning life, two pages. Right. Next page. This is one I have. Concerning wisdom, intellect, reason, truth, faith. Each one of these he's going to talk about so you can see the necessity for certain ideas all fitting together, then you'll know when it's appropriate, you know when it's not appropriate. Okay. Therefore, as it builds, you find what's appropriate, and as you're working up, you're left with fewer and fewer terms since you've already concerned yourself with a certain set, you've been able to identify them, you see in what kind of universe they're proper and which ones they're not. And so, of course, when you finally get up, next kerning power, justice, and then concerning the great, the small, the same, the similar, the dissimilar, rest, motion, and equality, which of course is Parmenides, the Plato's Parmenides. Concerning peace, what is meant by being itself, life itself, power itself, which is from Proclus. And the God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords, the last chapter concerning perfect and one. And when you're left with it, you're left with only two words, perfect and one, 
and then each one of those drops out, so you're left with nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, let me, let me, I'd like to just, just quickly read one of them, which is a relic. This is, a, as I say, this is only two pages, and uh, I can just read for a little bit here. Now let us praise the eternal life from which comes life itself and all life, and from which is imparted to all things, howsoever they participate in life, the life appropriate to each. Now, he's going to take the idea of life now, and he's going to put it in different categories. First category. Now the life of the immortal angels and their immortality, their indestructible nature, their angelic perpetual motion are and subsist from it and for its sake. Wherefore they are called ever living, immortal, and yet not immortal, because they have not from themselves their immortal being and eternal life, but they proceed from the life giving cause which creates and sustains all life. He's now going to go through a philosophical exploration of why you have to use terms in a certain way and understand them in a certain way. That's what he's doing. I'm going down to the, I'll just hit a couple of sentences from each paragraph. And it gives first to the self-subsistent life its essential life. And to the whole of life and to each living being it gives that which is adapted to its own nature. To the super celestial lives the immaterial and the godlike, chainless immortality and their unswerving and their, uh, inerrant perpetual motion, while its boundless overflow through its all prolific goodness extends even to the life of demons. So he's going to show how the idea of life, the basic principle of life, can be said to express itself throughout the entire universe. So he's going to show you in every one of these spheres, how it is functioning. Then he's going to make a statement about the whole. He's going to relate all the parts together in a meaningful way. Now you know about life. That's Dionysus' work. Yeah, these are, yeah. And interesting enough, they're very thin books. Like you have the whole mystical theology in five pages. Now look here, you know what this is interesting about? This is the most interesting thing. I wanted to now push it another step. What can you do, what else can you do with this? In today's intellectual world, the Neoplatonic thought is being used to explore the Gita, the Upanishads, Sri Aurobindo, Advaita Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta uh, uh, Samkara, or, uh, Shankara, it should be an H, Shankaracharya. It's also used to explore Judaism, Hindu thought, Buddhist thought, Gnostic thought, because this is the basic intellectual structure that is meaningful within itself, where all the terms are appropriate, interrelate to one another, have a mutual coherence together. Therefore, any system, to the degree that it's going to be intellectual, must not necessarily fit within it and can be used to explain it. Let me give you a problem here. In Buddhism, uh, there is a, in the uh, Abhidharma Abhid school or Abhidharma Kosa, Kosa school, they have a very major meditation system of four stages. And what they have is a form meditation and a formless meditation. Now, the way in which they describe these, especially Buddha Gosha, is very terse. That, what I mean by that is that there aren't many words used to describe it. They don't go at great length to try to explain all of the processes going on and how to understand it. They just virtually state it, very much like the Platform Sutra. So the question then is, if you're involved in meditation, you go from the form meditation to the formless meditation. The whole goal 
is to finally reach a consciousness, a consciousness right, of infinite space. Then the next stage is to then have a, a formless meditation where you have no longer a consciousness of space. Space drops out and all you have is a sense of the consciousness being infinite. Then you drop that, you drop that sense of consciousness, and then you have only that sense of uh, nothingness. The last and the highest state is said to be where you drop both the perception and non-perception, using the word perception in the highest sense. Now, in the literature, in the literature of comparative religion, there is the, there are a certain set of very interesting questions. Uh, let me first give you the form meditation. Uh, they have Sanskrit names for it, but the way they're traditionally expressed is a lot of more fun. All right, think here of a beautiful. What is that? No, 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 I don't want this so high. No, no. There he goes. This is a very good looking bee. I know I don't have to write the word bee for you. But here he is, and he's spotting a very beautiful flower, as you can see. All right. Stage one. Pursuit of All right. second stage of the four meditation. All right where the bee is circling around it. Third stage of meditation. They describe it as someone wandering and suddenly discovers in a desert area a lake. And they're filled, with, therefore, with joy at the prospect of it all. And the last stage, fourth stage, well, there's the five stages, excuse me. And the last one is very easy to draw. All right. He lands in the lake and he's enjoying the heck out of it, right? And this is happiness. This is the way they talk about it. Fifth stage, uh, it doesn't follow this. What it does follow, it's the tortoise. Uh, there he is. Now, that's called ekagrata, ekagrata. But the, uh, forget the Sanskrit for a moment. The reason it's chosen is because these are six limbs. That's the five senses and the intellect. And when you can withdraw into yourself, right, like the tortoise does its limbs, then you are fixed in a state of meditation. And that's called the fifth stage, ekagrata, or uh, uh, called uh, uh, the tortoise, tortoise state. Now, in the literature, there's a question of whether or not, when I talk about the literature, I mean there are different schools in the Abhidhi Dharma school, which takes positions about how to understand this traditionally over many, many centuries. And they argue this way. Some say, all of these are merely this. Some argue that, that each one of these is separate and distinct, separate and distinct, and they follow this in sequence. Others say, no, you focus on the first, and then this naturally develops. It naturally develops. You don't have to do anything more. It's simply a consequence of being in the first state that you get the second. And some other systems, same, same, same tradition, by the way, the Ab Ab Abhidharmakosa school, they'll argue that, no, no, these two are related. If you get this, if you get the first one, this comes naturally, this immediately follows. So therefore, you only have really one state you're getting into, and you just have to watch these emerge. 
and you don't have to struggle to reach another state, another state, another state. Well, there are many positions taken in respect to there's no solution to it. Now, what's interesting now is a group of people who are involved with Neoplatonic thought look at this and they say, you know what's possible? It's possible that if we study this, we might be able to find that using pseudo-Dionysius, what we've been doing tonight, we might be able to apply that to this. We might be able to make sense of this in terms of what we've done. Oh, well. You see, one of the arguments here is if you really only have one state and these follow naturally, you may only have two distinct states with transitions between them. Wait a minute, could that be the difference between the transcendent maker and the fifth and the last state that goes beyond it all? Well, in any case, all right, this is the kind of thing they are now doing. And if you like this kind of thought and these kinds of explorations, there's a whole body of literature that has been coming out for a few years now. And here it is. This comes out of Bain Harris's work, Neoplatonism and Indian Thought. There's another one on Neoplatonism and Jewish Thought, another one on uh, uh, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism and Jewish Thought, Gnostic Thought. And there's also one here on the significance of Neoplatonism. There are about five or six volumes so far. But there's another one which is very interesting. And uh, Uh, it's all right. Um, I don't need it. I didn't bring it. But I, I have a note on it, and I can read you, read you the note. Um, hmm? Yes, please, just jump ahead. So, just getting back to the mystical theology just for a minute, and the last things we were, you were talking about, are you saying that we cultivate our minds by the cultivation of our minds with the various systems, theology, divine names, mm -hmm. and symbolic theology, that in and of itself will help us to go beyond our minds? Wouldn't you agree that in your own field you gained a great facility when you found that certain words can be used in very special ways, and with that specialized way of using your vocabulary, it gave you a great deal of freedom and expertise in the field that you are now in? I suppose that's equally true in this game. Maybe we should do that with our minds itself, with the highest ideas. Would that then give us a certain freedom and a certain way we can use our mind with great direction and distinction? No difference. No difference. So he's taking the highest object of thought, idea of God, and saying that is so significant for the human mind that all of the ideas that are associated and attached with it cause all the problems we have. By properly identifying them and knowing how they should function, that allows us with a certain discipline and control over the very ideas that previously went at random or out of personal, you know, uh, personal history, religious background, family backgrounds, things of that nature. So I have a question. Oh, yeah. Sir. Yeah, the, uh, right next to formless, formless meditation, it looks like there's two words the same, consciousness. Consciousness of infinite space, oh. infinite consciousness, nothingness. Or oh, city. Right. Okay. Now, uh, this is a very fine article by the name of Rodier, R-O-D-I-E-R, -E in this series on Neoplatonism and the Hindu tradition. Let me give you his conclusion. If this analysis is correct, then not only does the parallelism between meditative accounts based on radically different metaphysics suggest that each account might have a common factual basis. 
a suggestion so brilliantly developed by a chap by the name of Wallace, W-A-L-I-S. But the structuring of the Neoplatonic account provides an answer to the inclusion of both the form and the formless meditation states in the Buddhist scheme, as well as suggesting that the account given by Bodhagosa of the structure of the formless meditative states is preferable. That means by using this analysis, you can then go back to the different positions the Buddhists have, and you can pick out one of them and say it's likely that he's correct. You know what that's, that's making it intelligible. It's making it all intelligible. Now, if it can do that with one Upanishad, if that can do this, this with one sutra, right? and if the same game is going on with the Bhagavad Gita, from the Upanishads, from Aurobindo, all of these, as well as in Buddhism, right? <laughs> as well as in Gnosticism, as well as in with Judaism, it may be that we're reaching the point where we might be able to say that the Neoplatonic tradition is the only, and only need, you only need one, intellectual system in which each one of these things is partial reflections. And with the proper use of language, we can clear up whatever difficulties there are to bring them all together into a unity. That's where it's going. Is that nice? Who's doing this work and where? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's where it's going. I don't know who's doing it. I mean, they're doing it in pieces, but I'm saying put them all together and that's what's going on. So, um, he has a lovely ac account of it. Um, if you went over it, you'd see that there are a couple of differences between the way I'm presenting it and what he's doing with it, but that's perfectly right. You'll find something great in his work. Now, I think the idea of a common intellectual system that can bring the best of all of these systems as parts and yet can take them and order them and deal with their problems that they have, both historically and with the different competing schools, may bring peace in each of the different systems. And when they come together, you know what they'll be doing? They will be verifying Neoplatonic thought from their own traditions. And that might bring about the end of religious wars because wars only exist when the differences are so severe that people will die for that difference and defend it. What this does is reconcile the differences into a higher system. Yeah, that, doesn't recognize, that doesn't reconcile economics. I think all wars are economic. Oh, sure. I had that view once. <laughs> no, no. I, I may still have it to some degree. Of course, some people fight for, for profit. Of course they do. Of course. Might as well make a buck on everything man does to some people. Oh, yeah. If there wasn't any profit, there wouldn't be any wars. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the way, there are some religious wars going on now where it's hard to believe that anyone's profiting, though. Would you agree? The mullahs in Iran. But somebody has to pay for the, the, the bullets and the guns. And the That's guns. true. That's and true. Those are the ones making money. That's true. But whether or not it has that as its basis, that's another question. By the way, then let's hope we can eliminate the profit makers as well. <laughs> I'm not against it. So, that's what I wanted to show you tonight. That's where I think all of this is going. And therefore, you can see on the next page, I have nothing more to say. Could you enlarge a little bit on Sri Aurobindo, seeing as this, uh, I'm not really that familiar with Sri Aurobindo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, you can do quite a bit. See, Sri Aurobindo was trained in Western philosophy, Greek philosophy. Who was this? Sri Aurobindo is one of the great leading Hindu philosophers. Oh, is he still alive? Uh, no, 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 no. And what most people don't recognize or, or discuss the fact that his, his early training was all, all European Greek thought, not Greek and Latin. And he was really schooled in it. His father wouldn't allow him to study anything Hindu until he reached maturity. He was a Hindu in England. His father resented his own traditions wanted him to become educated and developed along the English pattern, and he had to recover it himself. By the way, the same as, uh, to, to a lesser degree, but similar, Gandhi. Yeah. 
tell. But uh, it's a, that's to be really a fine study. And uh, I gave Dr. Harris downstairs a whole file of my notes on uh, Aurobindo, which is kind of fun. I used to know a philosopher, Hindu philosopher, that was very much involved in Sri Aurobindo. In any case, one last thing. There is a movement, and it's a journal of Western cosmological tradition, Alexandria, and it tends to uh, bring it together a lot of this material. So uh, please, I'll leave it up here for you to see. And these are the books I wanted to take a look at. So very well, thank you for. There was another book you were looking for. Is that Yes, it is. I was going, yeah, well, I had a Xerox copy. I wanted to get that quote, oh. and I, I read the, from the Xerox copy I have on my table. I did want to bring the book out. What was but, the book in the series? Pardon me? What was the book in that series? Uh, Rodier's article on, uh, um, I don't know what they call the, the formal title to the article, but I can get it for you. No. Was in one of those books, right? Yes, Which the one on it? Neoplatonic thought and Hindu, Hinduism. Okay. Hinduism. All right. And uh, I should have kept the uh, title in my notes, but of course I didn't. Um, but it's the oldest tradition. He's, he reports on the oldest tradition, which is the Abhidharma Kosha school. It's a very interesting paper. You'll could look at. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this Fantastic. And, and you have yeah. two translations. One I got from a friend of mine, Rod Wolbank, and uh, the other is Ellen Watts' translation. And, uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy Pseudo Dionysius. I think he's the most important figure in Western European thought. But, you see, this is a forgery book, or... Uh... Yes. You see, the problem with, with, the problem with history is that uh, it isn't well known that at one time Christianity and Hellenic thought were thought to have gone on parallel lines. And they had a common origin with Moses. Now, this was a view that was accepted in the second century A.D., and therefore, when the Greek texts came into Europe in the 14th century, they already believed that they were in a common tradition, and therefore they just used these writings and made it all part and parcel of the Christian tradition. Now, Dionysius, this chap that we're writing, reading from, pardon me, right? Dionysius was said to have been the companion of St. Paul. That's the way the writings are structured. Now, yeah, and he did all of his writings and he provided the foundation for Christian metaphysics. St. Thomas Aquinas quotes him about 1,700 times in his writings, which is astonishing. Now, just one last thought. Now, uh, therefore, he was accepted. He was accepted. He played a major role in developing Christian theology. And then in the uh, 15th century, uh, a chap by the name of Valla came along. Uh, pardon me, I, Isaac uh, uh, Casabandu came along in the 17th century and uh, looked at this whole argument and said, excuse me, there's something wrong with this. The dating is all screwed. Uh, none of these people could have been contemporaries. The dates paralleling the prophets and the early Greek philosophers don't match. And they thought uh, Zoroaster was one of the people who were contemporary with Moses, and that didn't occur for many hundreds of years later, a thousand years later, actually. So, therefore, there's, 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 this is a myth. Parallel lines are a myth. But Dionysius came along and did something even more remarkable. You see, pardon me, not Dionysius, whoever was the author of Dionysius, he borrowed, he took from the Greek philosophers, primarily Proclus, 470 AD. Right? He took all of that writing and he infused it into Christianity giving the appearance that, he would, that the author was a companion of St. Paul. Therefore, later thinkers in Christian thought accepted him because they thought of him as being a companion of St. Paul, and that gave it a great deal of legitimacy. Therefore, through Dionysius came Proclus, and the Greek thought came pouring into Christianity. 
that made it intelligible. Now Lorenzo Valla came along and said, excuse me, I have news for you. I made a close reading of Dionysius's writings and I can prove that they're a forgery. Therefore, they rejected all of his writings. But when they rejected it, you see, what they did is they rejected all the inte inte intellectual basis that made Christianity intelligible. So now you're left with fundamentalism and watered-down Protestantism that can't relate its own teachings to the Bible. Yeah, so that's, a, that's worthwhile studying. Lorenzo Valla, the influence of Lorenzo Valla, V-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, major, major contributor to this whole game, Lorenzo Valla. Yeah, Lorenzo Valla. This is, this is a letter to uh, Timothy. Yeah. Oh, this is the same Timothy that was a friend of Paul, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Maybe yeah. Timothy was the guy that was, maybe he was... Well, all kinds of internal arguments can be made, and it's been pretty much accepted by nearly everyone who reads the Greek that the style of Greek was written, had a different style and a different kind of content yeah. vocabulary. And there's so many close correspondences between Dionysius's writings that you have in front of us and Proclus that you finally have to conclude that uh, uh, the only way, the only hypothesis you can come from is that one influenced the other. But if Dionysius lived at the time of St. Paul, that would make him 407 years old. <laughs> Which is, you know, difficult to, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not, you know. Or you can say, yeah, or you can say what it really was is Dionysius studied with Proclus and then got reincarnated back to the time of Paul. No, no, don't believe that. Don't believe that. <laughs> Irreverence, irreverence. Okay. Oh, well, maybe, maybe Timothy was part of the uh, conspiracy. <laughs> oh, see, his letters are the same thing. You see, the letters of Dionysius, uh, one of the letters purports to, be, purports to be a description of the crucifixion, where Dionysius was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. So for hundreds of years, people used that as evidence that Jesus Christ was crucified, and he was the only witness. And he wrote letters to uh, the Apostle John and therefore had a great influence on the whole development of the whole style of thinking, all of which is based upon a forgery. So we don't know who this person is. No, no, no one has figured out who he was. But the date of it, the date is very suggestive. You see, the date they put on this writing, Dionysius, now they call him Pseudo-Dionysius because the phony, right. The, the probable date is somewhere around 530 to 532, according to many experts. Based on the, the way the text yeah. and the words yeah. and the language at that time. But at 529 AD, Justinian closed down Plato's schools of philosophy. The philosophers were exiled out of Athens and they went to Syria. And they found, the, they found these copies under a rock in Syria. Uh, three years later. You don't think there's any relationship between one and the other, do you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Must have been a philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I mean, it's certainly. The close use of language and technical language runs through the whole thing. It's okay, it's been claimed that the, before, uh, before Jesus' time, there was a group in Turkey called the Christos. And a lot of the theology, and then Paul was acquainted with this, he, he kind of put a lot of this Christos ideas and got Christos and Christ kind of mixed up. Oh, In other words, he kind of confused the issue. Yeah, I, I don't mind that. So yeah. In other words, there was a very, Christian, very like was it. one of the yeah. great the hippo, the guy of hippo, said there was a Christian yeah. religion existed before yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jesus. And then he used Jesus to kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. Slapped him on top of what they yeah. already had. Yeah. 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 Very good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We ending our career.